Good evening, and welcome to the special meeting of the Solon Board of Education. Mr. Buchanan, would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Abramowitz. Here. Mrs. Barksdale. Here. Mr. Heckman. Here. Mr. Patton. Here. Mrs. Clapp. Here. Mr. Bolton, would you like to begin the meeting? Absolutely. Uh, so this was meant to happen in a single meeting, but because our, our uh, responsive practices and facilities team were so thorough, uh, we felt the need to break it up and put it into two meetings. So just to refresh everyone's memory, what we are doing here in these work session meetings, we are basically reviewing our progress up until this point on our strategic plan uh, strategies. We had four strategies that when the committee came together to work on, there were four strategies. One was in communications, one was in finance, one was in facilities, and one was in responsive practices. And for each of those, we had several action plans that we were working on to complete. Uh, last, last time we were together, we reviewed the responsive practices, which covered uh, the professional development we're doing with our teachers uh, for, to work on classroom culture and, and educating our kids, as well as reviewed some of the other practices that we are currently doing. Uh, we talked about our staffing in the social emotional learning space and how we've made adjustments there. We then transitioned into facilities where we reviewed plans for uh, possible new school or uh, renovation of our existing high school and talked about the uh, associated costs that would be involved in those things as well as looking at our overall site plan for the main campus of the district uh, and looking at uh, possible future improvements down the road for our other facilities. Tonight, we're going to be covering finance and we're going to be covering communications. So um, in the finance section, we'll be talking about the several strategies we have under communication and revenue sources. And then in communications, we have several things we're going to be covering about communicating all of the good work that we've been doing in all of the other pieces. So I wanted to start with um, if there were any questions that anybody had or things that you were mulling over over the materials that we had last time to see now that you've had a little bit of time to, to mull it over, if there were any other questions that you may have had about our um, facilities or responsive practices presentations. I know they were pretty thorough last time, but I just wanted to double check and make sure in case there was something else that just was stuck in your craw and you needed to ask away. Hearing none, we are going to proceed. So Tim, you have the floor, sir. Okay, okay. I need to stand up and talk when it comes to finances. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> Again, um, for those of you who know me, or have uh, worked with me, or any taxpayers uh, that have uh, spoken with me over the years, I think everybody understands and knows that I work for the taxpayers at Solon, I work for our school district, and at any time, anybody has questions, uh, wants me to stop in their home, talk about things, uh, come into my office, stop and talk about any specific topics uh, regarding our finances. I'm definitely happy to do so, and I have done so over the years. So having said that, I'm going to be covering uh, a few items. Feel free to uh, jump in and ask any questions whenever you would like. Our strategy one regarding financial resources and communications during our strategic planning meeting was that we will educate our policymakers and stakeholders about the financial challenges facing the Solon Schools community and actively engage them to find solutions that secure funding for the growing financial needs of the district. We had two specific results. Public education campaign was our specific result one, which was to design and implement a public education campaign to continuously disseminate information to our entire community on how our Solon City Schools are funded. Specific result number two, our alternative funding viability. Determine the viability of alternative funding options to generate new revenue for the Solon City Schools. Within that uh, strategy one, result one, the public education campaign, we really broke that into three uh, subsections. One was know your schools, our finance facts. Two was our popular annual financial report otherwise known as our PAFR, and three is our semi-annual five-year forecast. Know Your Schools 
uh, we have uh, that is an online monthly publication. And Tammy obviously does the, I, I believe, what is the lion's share of the work because I don't, uh, I don't necessarily communicate the best sometimes when it comes to those hard numbers and put it in layman's terms sometimes. And Tammy does a wonderful job working with me uh, and our district putting our Know Your Schools together on a monthly basis. Uh, we have shared our, some of our district's financial challenges as well as some of our uh, district's financial successes. Tim, if I may jump in for just one second. He's really, I, I don't want to minimize the work that Tammy does. Tim speaks in spreadsheet, uh, which is not the thing that all of us speak in. And so she does an amazing job of being able to translate those things into concrete information that people can use. I don't want to minimize the Know Your Schools Online component. The feature that we use is called Finance Facts, it's something that comes out. It's not every month, but it's close to every month where we feature something that has to do with school finance. Just this last time that we went in, we talked about how much of our, how much of our tax dollars come from local sources versus federal sources and how many of those dollars are put directly into classrooms. That's just one example of a host of them. And if you look in your book under the finance section, it's the first blue tab, we've compiled a collection of some of those finance facts. We felt it was really important at the beginning of this program to really lay a strong foundation so that people can understand and they have things to refer back to about how the schools are funded and how we operate financially. It helps towards our goals of being transparent with our community as well as really communicating to our constituents how their dollars are being used. Sorry, too much wonder. Absolutely. No, thank you, Fred. The, uh, the next item, the PAFR, this is an item that uh, uh, some schools will do in governmental entities across the state. It's not a requirement, um, but I love the PAFR, and I had uh, created it when I came here, the format uh, of this report, because what happens is, is our financial statements are on cash basis. We need to file gap statements. It's a bunch of accounting jargon that, in my opinion, Nobody really cares to take a look at the overall financial statements of the school district. It's just, it's just a lot of words, a lot of spreadsheets, and just you can get lost in it. The PAFR is an easy to read uh, document that's about eight pages or so. And I think that what it does is it's, a, it's an outstanding summary of a lot of the items that our taxpayers would like to know about our district you know, as a, from a percentage standpoint, where our revenues come from, where our expenditures, where our money goes, where are we from an effective tax rate, a taxing mechanism compared to other schools across the, across the county? And, um, and it, does, it does a wonderful job just capturing all of that information. Uh, Tammy uh, uh, does make sure that uh, we put that online uh, for people to see once that's uh, generated. Every year, it's usually uh, uh, posted online. The new one uh, is uh, usually uh, late summer, uh, early fall of each year. What about for people who don't necessarily go online all the time? Are our are, are citizens, they receive something as well? So, um, and I know Tammy's going to be talking about this when we get to the communication thing. One of the things that we do each month when we do the Know Your Schools Online, one of these comes out each month with that. It's kind of a reminder. And that QR code, if you just scan it with your phone, mm -hmm. it'll automatically take you to the Know Your Schools Online. And one of our, one of our finance facts each year when that comes out is a brief description of the PAFR as well as a direct link to it. So okay. anybody who's interested could do these. We've expanded this to actually have these cards as well as copies of the Know Your Schools in our senior center right now, so, so that you can actually grab those in there. So we're trying different avenues to get this information out to people. I think that's one of the things we've all decided and, and really is a reality is that the more our population, our Solon community, not just people with parent, with children in the school district, but everyone, the, the better understanding they have of the financial challenges and the financial successes too of the school district is, is really important. That way when, when it is time for a levy or it is time for a bond issue, they understand you know, why this is happening and, and really are, have a pretty clear picture of what's going on. So that's great. Absolutely. The next item is our five-year forecast. Our five-year forecast I've talked about on a couple of uh, occasions every year. We're required by the state of Ohio 
um, to create a five-year forecast, which uh, consists of the previous three years of actual numbers, and then as well as the current business year, school year, and then in the next upcoming four-year projections. Those are required. Our business year begins on July 1 of each year. So July 1 of 2024 is our 24-25 school year. So our business year begins July 1, 24, and it ends June 30 of 25. So our first forecast for this year has not been created yet. Uh, that is due to the state at the end of November 25. Uh, so I will be taking that uh, to, uh, to you for approval at our November meeting. The second forecast is due to the state at the end of, by the end of May each year. Now what I would like to do is just highlight some, uh, some items. So, you know, um, and we'll talk about uh, the strategy for result two a little bit later um, after, we, after we jump into uh, uh, some numbers that I would like to discuss. Mm -hmm. I wanted to cover you know, a, a, a few highlights in our Know Your Schools, and it will generate some additional, uh, perhaps some points that would be beneficial. Um, uh, in our Know Your Schools, the finance facts, there's an efficient use of uh, funds measure and I would like, that's one item that I would like to point out that we did have in our Know Your Schools. And these are, um, these are raw numbers provided to the state, not manipulated by us, and it compares us to the state as well as our comparison districts. Our classroom instruction, 70.5% 70 of our expenses go directly to the classroom. Classroom instruction. Comparable districts are 67.9% and statewide is 66.9%. So overall, we, our dollars touch the kids directly in the classroom more than all of our similar district, all of our peers, as well as the state average. That's, uh, that's one key fact that I'd just like to point out about Solon Schools. We, are, we already know a couple other key facts that was in that Know Your Schools publication for that month, which is local dollars we fund locally our schools significantly greater than most other schools based on the state's unfair funding formula. We know that, we've talked about it, we're at 77% local share compared to the state's 41%. State dollars are shared to other school districts in a much greater percentage, same thing as federal, compared to us, we receive a smaller share. There's nothing we can do about that, and we do know that. That's, that's the nature of our school district and state funding. The Know Your Schools, to give you an idea, we talked about uh, the PAFR, uh, a little bit touched upon that. Uh, we, in another Know Your Schools item, we talked about our internet uh, upgrades and moving from 10 gig, or 2 gigs to 10 gigs, saving about $4,000 annually and more than doubling our speed. Another item I uh, talked about in one of our know, our know Your Schools was our debt. We are in the pretty rare situation, unusual situation in which we are very low debt. And in fact, by December of 2025, we're going to be debt free, which is wonderful news. We have taken advantage uh, of every way possible over the years to refinance debt, receive uh, a better, more tractable rate so that we could pay down our debt faster. And, um, and we have two more debt payments. Our primary debt principal payments are in December of every year. So we have our debt payments in December of 24, interest payments in June of 25, and then our final debt principal payments in December of 25, and we'll be debt free. Tim, could you talk a little bit about that? I, How long I, does that last? I'm sure there's some, I know you always talk about superintendent math mm -hmm. versus treasurer math. So sometimes my understanding of that uh, needs a little help. Explain this concept of, of debt as far as a school. I, I know for us, we have a mortgage, we pay our mortgage and going through that. I, explain what you mean when you're saying debt as it works in a public school. That's, no, perfect. Uh, what I will do is I'll piggyback that with another Know Our Schools from January, which are the different types of levies that school districts can go for, which is an operating levy, a permanent improvement levy, and a bond issue. So let's talk about the bond issue first. The bond issue is what ties to the debt piece of it. If we wanted a school, we would uh, determine 
the amount uh, that said school would cost, the project would cost. And then we would work with the Cuyahoga County uh, uh, office to determine if we wanted, uh, and, a fi and a finance specialist uh, that's uh, involved in debt instruments in the market for borrowing funds. And if our project was $150 million, we would work with that, uh, with the county to determine how many mills it would take to pay for that project. That debt, that bond issue would be submitted before the uh, taxpayers for vote. And should that pass, there will be debt issued, we'll receive the proceeds, and then we will pay for that $150 million project. And then that bond issue, which is a levy, we receive those monies in every year from our taxpayers. The taxpayers pay the county, the county pays us, and then we pay for the debt. And then what this, so basically what that means is, is that our old bond issues for our old building projects are all just about paid off. And those are all directly tied to uh, two specific projects that we had 25, 30 years ago. Your typical bond issuance is, is nowadays 30, 35 years, uh, right around there. I believe you might be able to even extend it out. Uh, the law has changed on that uh, from uh, time to time. We might be able to go out to extend to 37 years, but it's some, somewhere around there. So a bond issue would act, has a beginning and an end. Yes, it we're, does. Say, a continue, we're a continuing operating levy does not. It would go on. That's absolutely correct. You have, so you have your operating levy. Operating levy can pay for staff salaries, benefits, classroom instruction supplies, basically everything other than a big project. And then, so that's an operating levy. It helps the districts operate. Now an operating could be a limited levy, in which case it might be a five-year levy, so that the taxpayers would vote for a limited levy, five-year levy, and at the end of the five years, there would be a renewal levy placed on, so that well, there wouldn't be any new money to the schools, it would be the same money, and if that renewal levy goes away, if they vote it down, then there's a big hole in revenues. We don't have any renewal levies in Solon. They're all continuing, which is a, uh, which is a massive positive because what we do from, from an educational standpoint is we don't just plan two, three, four years out. We're thinking 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, 20 years down the road. We're thinking about what the incoming kindergartners are going to be able to study and the classes that they're going to take when they're in middle school, when they're in high school. And if we're at risk of always being on the ballot for old monies that were getting ready to expire at the end of five years, and then maybe new monies a year or two later, and would those new monies be, uh, be limited monies, then all of a sudden you find yourself as a district, and it's a very dangerous situation to get in where there's voter fatigue because you're just voting for a levy after a levy after a levy. And most of the time, or too many times, people think that it's new money when they're voting for those, and it's really not. It's just supporting what the districts all received in past years. So that's your operating levy. And the other piece is your permanent improvement levy. Your permanent improvement levy, uh, our school district has done a wonderful job with PI levies uh, over the years. They, again, can be limited or they can be continuing. Ours are continuing. And permanent improvement levies are for uh, the purchase of assets, could be buses, could be technology, uh, could be for refurbishments uh, of our facilities, and in which case also what we did a number of years ago, uh, if you recall, was we had uh, put on the ballot, and that was, uh, t -t -t what year was that? 18? Yeah, that was 18. in 2013. The stadium? In November 5, 2013, well, uh, one piece that we did was we went ahead and we figured out a way to restructure our debt we restructured our debt. We were able to drop 0.8 mills off of our operating. And then we asked for 0.8 mills to be passed by our voters. 0.4 mills of that was for permanent improvement security dollars, safety and security dollars. 
And then 0.4 mils of that was for safety and security operating dollars. Mm -hmm. That's how we hired the additional operating <coughs> staff of, of, uh, for safety and security, our director of security and safety, and that's how we have been primarily funding all of our safety and security renovations throughout the district is from that 0.8 mil levy that we did back in 2013 that we passed. So does that answer your question regarding the debt? Yep. Okay, wonderful. I wanted to talk about, um, you know, as far as know your schools, uh, there's the finance piece of it and we, uh, that I'm, I'm concerned about. And let's talk about that, that first, the five-year forecast piece. Uh, the five-year forecast piece, and I, I'm not, um, you can pull out your five-year forecast right now if you would like, um, because all of this, it, it, we could run through a couple of the highlights within, within our schools as it relates to the five-year forecast. What I'm concerned about for, uh, for Solon schools now, uh, from a state funding standpoint, is our the voucher program in the state of Ohio. Mm. The voucher program is a piece that right now, uh, what the state's doing is, is if you want to go, to, if you would like as a, as a parent to send your child to a private school, you know, K-12 private school, there are vouchers available for that child to go to that private school and based on their pop, based on the, the homeowner's poverty index, based on their economic ranking, they will get more dollars towards that voucher although, or they'll get less. And so they, they can use that money to go directly to the private school. Currently, what's happened is, is we've seen an increase in our state funding. We've seen a nice increase between last year to this year. One of the nicer increases that we've received in the past, that's all fat. So for these two years in the state's binding budget, the state's budget process is a two year, two year process. And so we're receiving those funds and then the state's paying for those vouchers. And maybe, maybe, uh, maybe some parents, I believe at a minimum, it's somewhere around 700 or $800. 10% it's uh, like $840, I wanna say it's 10% of the the base of the total voucher cost, which is eight thousand four hundred and eight for high school and six thousand one hundred and sixty-six for uh, the elementary, so uh, K, K sure. eight. So it's under the minimum amount a parent would receive to send their child to a private school would be a little under a thousand dollars. Let's call it eight hundred bucks. Um, based on again your wealth, that could be a couple thousand dollars. It goes follows the student, and they're going to private school. Schools aren't paying for those right now. There's been a lot of talk in Columbus. I have heard that sooner or later, what is going to be presented is that the school districts, public school districts, they pay for the vouchers so that those dollars would come from us, follow the student to go to the private school. And that's a big concern of mine. Um, uh, it's not. It's not the case of a failing school district. Right? It's not as, the case as was of a failing school intended. district. That's correct. Uh, so uh, this would be any school district at all. You could be the best school district in the state of Ohio and still be. You could be the best school district in the private country. Education. Uh, public. Last year, the voucher program cost the state nine hundred and sixty-six million dollars. And we received a little bit of an increase. So. I can see it set up. We've seen this happen before, right? Tangible personal property tax. We've seen this. We've lived this. Let's make no uh, let's let's make no bones about it. TPP and what happened to Solon Schools is why we don't have a high school already built. Think about it. And for those that don't remember, hey, well, what's he talking about TPP? Just real quick, tangible personal property tax. That was a taxing mechanism by the state of Ohio to tax heavy machinery and equipment, businesses, commercial uh, businesses. And so Solon Schools was designed in a way to have a commercial industry, have a residential component uh, to the entire community so that we had a broad-based tax structure to help, uh, help share the costs to provide our education, if you will. We were told in the early 2000s, hey, in order for the state of Ohio to be business friendly, we need to change the taxing mechanism. 
which was the CAT tax, commercial activities tax, is what the bill of gold, goods that we were sold. That was going to be a broader based commercial tax. We'll do away with the TPP tax, service industry, commercial service, it will be heavy industry won't be as taxed as much and it will reach more businesses and it will generate just as much, if not more. It will be more attractive for businesses to come to Ohio, businesses to stay in Ohio. That's what we were sold. And we were also sold and told that don't worry, Solon City Schools and uh, governmental entities that are highly reliant on TPP dollars, those dollars are not gonna leave our schools. We're gonna be held harmless in perpetuity, period. Those dollars are never gonna leave. So what they did, they said, we're gonna pass this. We supported it. We wanted to be, we wanted to be a good teammate in the state of Ohio. There, there was, if we were said, told anything else, of course we would have been opposing it, but school districts across the state, those that were heavily reliant, nobody opposed that because they were gonna be held harmless. Those dollars were gonna be frozen in time. Those dollars meant to us, even in real time dollars uh, uh, 15 years ago, you're talking about almost 20%, it was 17% of our district's budget and about $11 million a year. Think about $11 million a year. Think about $11 million a year back 10 years ago, even 15 years ago, think about how much a new high school would have cost then. Right now we're talking about 150 to $175 million. Right now on today's dollars, what a high school would have cost, the TPP dollars alone at $11 million a year that is paid for in, in, in 15, you know, 15 years. Uh, and it, it's very simple to see that TPP, for those who understood and have, have, have heard us talk about TPP and what it did to us, because what ended up happening is we created an organization and fought in Columbus when we found out, hey, guess what? Those dollars that you were gonna keep getting forever, we just didn't finish that little piece of legislation. Sorry, so those dollars are gonna to begin to leave. So those dollars, when they were getting ready to leave, we decided to go ahead and we were worried they were gonna take them all from us at once. We built up that cash fund balance to provide for education for the next five, seven years if all of those dollars were gonna be taken from us at one time. And that's why we built up our cash balance. And we said that once TPP dollars are gone, we'll spend that cash balance down on our facility needs. And that's what we're doing now. That we've told everybody, we made good on that, we're making good on that. And it's not a bunch of frivolous items. It's, it's, the, it's the bricks and mortar, uh, it's the roofs, it's the parking lots. There's a lot of capital improvements that need to be made and we're in, uh, making those. But having said that, the TPP was almost crippling to our district and we needed to issue a code right, if you will, and focus on just educating our kids, providing the best education we could. So now I'm worried about vouchers. It's not to that degree, obviously, at this point, but could it be four or five years down the road? If we're looking at a new building and if we're trying to not pass dollars on to our taxpayers, or at least minimal dollars, the least amount possible onto our taxpayers, I'm worried about what if we make decisions and in a couple years from now, the state's next budget process, we find out that we're gonna be on the hook for a lot of vouchers for our kids to go to private schools. That is a concern of mine. Something else that's been a hot, a hot uh, button item in our five-year forecast, and it's the very first line, the general property tax revenues. Property taxes, let's talk about property taxes. What's the big item that we've heard about over the last, uh, over the last few months? Reappraisal. Reappraisal values. Values. Well, let's talk about what happens in the state of Ohio. Every three years, there's a process. There's a reappraisal and there's an appraisal. We just went through our appraisal process in the county. It's on a county by county basis. And it's a way to keep up times with market value of the homes. The point that I want to make here is, is that the county has some great tools. They have a 2024 sex annual reappraisal overview online. They have a wonderful reappraisal tax calculator online. And what you'll see is that Solon City Schools, within Solon, anybody know what, to, what the uh, average market value of the homes went up for the reappraisal period, percentage-wise? I think some percent. It's 25%. 
Home values, 25% went up. So what do you think that the taxpayer thinks? Yeah, they think we got it. <laughs> yeah, taxpayer thinks bills are going to go up 25%. I could really dive deep into it, and I'll just try to touch upon it, but there's something called House Bill 920 that keeps that from happening. So you know how much the average bill is going to go up from a percentage standpoint? Does the taxpayer do their 25% market value increase? It's going to go up roughly 1.95%. Um, Tax bills are going to go up an average of a little under 2% while their home values increased 25%. And if you're not sure about that, take a look on the, on the, uh, on the Cuyahoga County Auditor's website. And it's uh, what you're going to type in is Cuyahoga County Fiscal Officer. And then you'll see on their page, on, you'll go to their web page, and below that you'll see 2024 sex annual uh, reappraisal. And then yes. below that, when you click on that, you're going to see the reappraisal tax estimator. And you can key it in. Key in your home's value. Estimate the 25% increased value on your home. And it's going to show your current tax bill, and it's going to show your, uh, your estimated new tax bill. So, Tim, that is the House Bill 920 essentially... The House Bill 920 states that however much money a levy was put on the ballot for, let's say it generated $7 million, it can never make more than $7 million. So if your property values go up, the effective millage, whatever that was, goes down so where you were only still making $7 million. It doesn't account for any kind of inflationary increases or anything like that. It's always a flat dollar amount. So if that levy generated $7 million, it's always going to be $7 million from now until the end of time, regardless of what happens unless a new tax is placed on the ballot. That's absolutely correct. And, and I can dive deeper into this, but for the interest of time, I won't. But I do want to point out one item. So again, saying it a different way, House <laughs> Bill 920, it ensures that if your home value was $200,000 in the year 2000, and it's now $400,000, the schools on a levy that was passed in the year 2000, if we generated $1,000 from your home for that levy, we're still generating the same $1,000. The tax factor is reduced to make sure that we're still receiving the same amount. So the other point that I just want to make is, is that, well, why is it then if the schools has a levy, doesn't have a levy on? If nobody has a levy on and all of a sudden my tax bill changed, why did it go up a little bit? That's a, standard, that's a standard question. Well, in the state's constitution, what happened years and years ago was there's something called inside mills. Inside mills, all governmental entities across the state of Ohio have 10 inside mills that they're taxed. That tax was never voted on. So House Bill 920 doesn't apply to those 10 inside mills. School districts usually receive the lion's share of those mills, usually uh, four to five mills. And then the rest might go to uh, parks, might go to library systems, might go to uh, fire, uh, might go to mental health services. So that's why tax bills will go up a little bit. But the point here is, is that what's shocking, especially when we're just finishing a, uh, in an actual six year appraisal year, when we all hear 25% market value increases, we think, I. Oh my, I'm not saying anybody can afford an increase these days in their tax bill. But what I can say is that while it's a 25% market value, value increase in your home, it's not a 25% increase in your bill. In fact, it's far from it. I thought it'd be about 3.5% or so, and again, it depends on a couple of tax credits that might apply or what have you. But when I plug everything in uh, for the uh, city of Solon, for Solon City Schools on that Cuyahoga County website, it's uh, averaging uh, right at 1.95%. So, so, Tim, I, I, I know you're probably going to cover this. So I just want to make sure. So Mike told us that the, the, the base high school, not with the, the extra pieces parts, Mike told us it's around $135 million. Mm -hmm. What does that look like in terms of a bond taxing? Like, what would that look like for a homeowner? Sure. Okay. Um, for the base model. Yep. Yeah. Just for the yes. for the yeah. base model. Just we want a new high school. 
It's going to be about $135 million in today's dollars. Not so, yeah, you don't want me to call it the base model. So based on, so let's talk about this. So obviously we're going through an appraisal, an appraisal process. So there's a tax complaint process, a reduction process, so I don't have updated numbers. But to give you an idea, um, an idea as of late, uh, late 2022 going into 2023, uh, that number for Solon was, you can count on basically one mil for every $25 million worth of a project. One mil. So a $1 million pro or a $100 million project would be approximately four mil. A $150 million project is approximately six mils. And let's talk about this. Uh, you now know, usual a $175 million project. Our usual operating levies are 6.9. Yep, usually operating just, levies just are 6.9. Just for some perspective on. Absolutely correct. So let's talk about a six mil versus, you know, a seven mil, uh, seven mil can I, can levy. Because I, mm -hmm. I know when I first heard mil, it's not short for million. That's no. correct. So do you mind repeating? Because it sounds like this is going to go out to other people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you mind maybe saying like like a one bullet point for people at home about what a mill is? A mill is the the numeric. Uh, it, it's point zero zero one times. Uh, I believe it's a thousand dollars worth of value is what I believe that it is. But it is basically the numeric equation factor to apply towards the value of a home and the value of a project. So let me say that if you were going for an income tax levy, mm -hmm. the measurement would be obviously a tax percentage, 1%, half a percent, uh, you know, 0.2%. A one mil levy is uh, the, the factor for a school district to place on a ballot to generate X amount of dollars on a property tax is a, what a one mil is. So if you, uh, a taxing rate is if you take a one mil is 0 0.001. So let's talk about the actual equation, if you will. A seven mil levy, let's talk about a $200,000 home. Okay, a $200,000 home, a seven mil levy would typically cost right about $490 for the year. And how you do that math is you take the $200,000 times 0.35%. That's a constant because that's how you get to your assessed valuation. So $200,000, so whatever value you want, you want to plug in for your home, times 0.35% is the constant, comes up to your assessed value. Then your assessed value and times the amount of mills, and I could help people out with that, so the assessed value on a $200,000 home is $70,000. It comes up to four, uh, $490 a year for seven, seven mills. Six mills, just to give you an idea, is $420 a year for a um, for six mill levy. Which is, which is a pretty common explanation when we are going for a levy. We let people know. Right. If you have, we let people know that if, you know, it's going to be $300 for every $100,000 worth mm -hmm. of value in your home. So it it's, is. So that people can have an understanding, because you're right, something people don't understand. You know, it's it's yeah. not as we're used to it because we do it all the time. And I'm wondering how many people have moved into Solon since <coughs> it was last discussed with the community. 2018 was the last time we had an issue on the ballot, and there's been a lot of turnover how since yeah, then. How mm -hmm. what but but we but those, those are the things we've been addressing in in our finance. Yeah issues on you know with know your schools and the idea that you know that's what that was the whole process of of this was that so our taxpayers would understand this so that it's not gee you only you only talk about this when there's a levy because that's not we want them to understand it we don't want mm -hmm. this to be culture shock or financial shock every time that we have to do something like this so i think that's why we're doing this whole process in the first place it is i think a lot of people get confused about the whole 35 percent portion of it they, a lot absolutely. of people don't even realize that their house, whatever their house is worth, isn't what they're being taxed. They're taxed on a percentage of what their house is worth. And we don't get any of that. What they really don't understand is, is that if, if property values went up 26%, that we don't get. It's, it's like having a job, having your every expense that you have go up and never getting a raise. Correct. And that's what schools are up against. We never get a raise mm -hmm. unless we go back to the taxpayer, which yes. is, is a very difficult ask. 
If we had an in, if we were funded by an income tax, obviously your our income tax revenue got the value increases of, everybody's income increase. Even if 920 wasn't there, and we got the value yes. of in, property taxes increasing. But the reason at 920, very good point. But that's exactly the reason that that's 920 right, came it. about because if 920 didn't exist. Mm -hmm. everybody's tax bills will be going up 25% right now right. because of the reevaluation. And so some would need it, some wouldn't. Correct. But so if you think about it, this is where the true value in Solon comes in, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what people have trouble wrapping their head around. In this case, unprecedented times, values went up 25%. Market values went up 25%. But your tax bill only goes up roughly 2%. So that's a good, you know, it's only good unless you, if you realize it through a sale. But you know, that's a, but that is a positive. Now, if I may, on that seven mil, let's run through just a little tier, if you will. Two hundred thousand uh, dollar value home. This is all seven mil levy assumption, uh, roughly. And this is estimates. Four hundred and ninety dollars a year. Three hundred thousand seven thirty five seven hundred thirty five a year. Four hundred thousand dollars nine hundred and eighty dollars a year. $500,000 home, $1,225 a year. Then I jumped up to $750,000 home, $1,837 a year. Uh, just to give everybody an idea of what that means roughly uh, for home values and what a seven mil levy uh, will cost. Mm -hmm. So you reference the assessed value versus market value, right? The assessed right. is what they they charge you for the county there. Yep, assessed is the value that you are taxed at. Right. Your taxable value of your home is your assessed value, which is your market value of your home, which is the appraised value is the right. value that it would sell for. Your market value or what it's appraised deemed to be able to be sold for. So that's the market value of your home. The assessed value is 35% of what you could sell your the value of your home. 35% is what it's taxed at. And, but again, remember that House Bill 920. It's pretty confusing uh, and what I just talked about. So as your home increases, you aren't taxed your, your new value on those old levies. To, to Fred's earlier point, though, I think what, you know, what I find can, not confusing but, but worrisome is, is that in, in, the, in the quest to be able to get a new high school or facilitate that or finance that we're also talking about increased operating levies along that way bond issues i mean what would we think you know if safe it's every five years and i guess i guess what i'm i'm talking what i'm trying to get at is what would be the bottom line or what would be the 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 tax exposure because i think our, our residents are going to have to understand sure let's you let's, know what this is could all cost let, let's so let's talk about that a little bit let's talk about what we've talked about as a team over the years and what we faced. So again, just the Cliff Snows version. TPP crashes on us. Almost 20% of our budget. We are in we are in emergency mode to try to figure out a way to to not simply pass on a 10 or 11 mil mil tax rate mil need onto our taxpayers. We have wonderful employees, wonderful unions. We sat down at the tables and said, we can't pass this all on to our taxpayers. We all need to work together. So over this period of time, since basically 2009 to current, what the district did was said, we need to make sure that we provide the best education to our kids. We can't put that at risk. So let's build up that reserve in case all those dollars are taken away from us. We can't go for a building. We can't do anything with our facilities other than keep everything safe and secure in a solid learning environment. That's what we've done. And then we work with our staff on, okay, what can we do from a salaries benefits standpoint? There were three years of 0% freezes for, and there were four years of 0% freezes for the administrators over those years. There were insurance concessions. We completely, changed uh, uh, early retirement incentives to help make certain that if possible, instead of paying somebody, uh, because people do love teaching. They love teaching, they love being around the kids, and they don't want to leave after they've been here so many years. And, and we love them being here, but as they're here longer, it's more costly. 
And we were self-funded for a number of years, so it's more costly from yeah. an insurance standpoint and a salary standpoint. So what we try to do is incentivize them. Hey, if you left so we didn't have to pay all those higher years and brought in somebody new, a new way to teach a, 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 a new, and, and, and cheaper and, and try to come up with a compromise, that's what we did. And we changed our insurance program completely. We jumped into a, uh, uh, we jumped into a COG, a Council of Governments, that is, we used to be standalone, self-insured, and we had a, a solid insurance product, um, but, um, but it was time to change. And what we changed to uh, is this pooled insurance program has about, I wanna say about 180 governmental entities, schools, some libraries, but it's primarily schools that operates a self-funded plan together. It's one uniform plan. You can't cherry pick. You can't say, I want this Cadillac plan, mm -hmm. this place wants this plan, this place, no. Everybody has a uniform plan and it has, it is, it has paved the way to be able to save dollars to help retain our teachers and attract some of the best teachers that Ohio has mm -hmm. because in order to remain competitive, we need to have the staff. In order to provide the best services uh, on, on buses, the cafeteria, because we, we're an entire team here and we have made no bones about it. We can't, we can't be the top paying, but we want to be the top performing. We want people to, as much as people can enjoy working and going where they uh, do to work in a school district, we want this to be the destination place for people to live in the destination place. This is the pinnacle in people's careers in school districts. This is where we want those people to live. <coughs> so it's been a balancing act. It's been a balancing act. Now, we've, so having said that during those times, we've extended our levy cycle for a number of years. We were uh, going for 6.9 mil levy every every three, four. Usually three, four. Outside, yeah, it's usually three, four years. I have the whole levy history right here. Three, four years. And during that time, and we had the economic downturn in that 2009, 2008, 2009, 2010 time period. TPP was uh, happening, crashing on us. The housing market was crashing. There were all kinds of issues. And that's when we really buttoned everything down. So we went for a levy in May of 2010. It was a 6.9. We did the refinance and, uh, and lowered the, what I talked about, that 0.8 mil, so it was no increased cost to our taxpayers in 2013. So our next operating levy was in 2018. So we had one in 2010, one in 2018, during a time where we were in the process of losing $11 million a year in TPP. Fast forward, this is now our concern. We have the need for a high school. Some people believe that it's a, you know, it's a greater need. How, much, how great of a need? Is it a need over this? So is it a need over that? Where does it fall on the priority list? But that's what we faced. We faced, okay, our kids are safe and secure. We aren't risking their education. We're gonna provide the best education possible. But now we need, we would like to have a new building. Our building's old, our high school's old. School districts run a significant risk if they place a bond issue on, it's hard enough to pass an operating levy. But if you put a bond issue on prior to an operating levy and you have yeah. new shiny building there, some there. people yeah. don't understand, well, wait a second, you have the shiny new building, now you're gonna come for money a year or two later, operating dollars, you shouldn't have built the building. Right. And then you risk not being able to provide the, that education to our kids in the classroom if you fail that operating levy. So, as I see it, uh, and what I've seen across the state, I believe the most important is our kids, right? Safety, security, and the instruction of our kids. I believe that we need to make sure that we pursue the operating levy first. Mm -hmm. Should the operating levy pass, should the Board of Education decide, you know what, we're interested in a high school, then we talk bond issue after. And what the, that's, just, that's just my... What's, what's the timing in your mind for... So the timing in my mind, operating levy, based on, again, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about vouchers and all that kind of stuff, but timing on my mind as far as an operating levy, it could be around. I wouldn't see it, I wouldn't see it not earlier. Could it be a year later? But to give you an idea, 
could be around the spring of calendar year 2026, which means that the board would pass its first resolution to put the levy on the ballot in the fall of 2025, right about a year from now, would uh, as early then as that won't collect then for another year. Then it wouldn't that. collect until one one of 27. It'd be effective one one 26, collected one one 27. That would be what I would see as the earliest for the operating levy. Um, perhaps a year later, but it's not a wide it's not a but wide are, window. Are, are we talking about a new high school during this? period of time well let's let's talk about that because you know I don't know how we don't do that I'm so we've sure. got the it's an awesome outstanding question uh, and with our high school we talked about the our agreement with the city correct and the in the in the city's pool how long is that a, a agreement for five years so we have five years that that pool remains there the city's pool so that fits perfectly with our time I believe mm -hmm. operating levy and at that same time, we're talking about that operating levy. Hey, this operating levy passes the very next year or two years afterwards, I would think at the most, we put the bond issue on. That would align with the timing for the pool that we would take ownership of the, the full property of the pool and the pool would be removed and we could then be getting ready to break ground. And so you're talking about at that time, you're talking about a, approximately a, a building levy uh, in the spring of 28, maybe the spring of 29, but you're talking about effective 1128 or effective 1129. When, so then it wouldn't be built for how long then? And that's when it, it would be based well, on Michael, if were we like doing new or were we doing years. the. But keep in mind that start to finish five years, there's preliminary work that goes into Correct. that. Right. That can be done. And there's going to be work that has to be done pre-bond issue for some design work that needs to be done, focus group work that needs to be done. That's all part of that five-year time frame. So it'll actually be a shorter number of years than five from when the bond issue hits because there's pre-bond issue work. And, and then we're working into an operating levy. Right. Uh, it, that's mean, the, at, that, at that timing schedule. I mean, I guess I'm just not. And we're not, not spring 25. We're talking fall 25. It, well, it would be after, spring of I'm 26 years would be yeah. spring of 26 uh -huh. would be the levy ballot when people would vote. vote. It would be the fall of 25 when the board, you have to pass a couple resolutions as yeah. a board. The first resolution passed by the board would be in the, you know, around the November-ish time period. Uh, uh, May ballot. Uh, November, December. I'm sorry. For the May ballot. For the, yes. May. Yeah. I, and again, maybe those dates have changed a little bit. Maybe yeah. it would be, uh, yeah. you know, the winter of 25, you know. Tim, uh, I, um, I could be wrong, but what you're talking about is a brand new building that would be on a certain piece of property and not what some of the others uh, offered, which was doing part of some of the current high school and, and replacing certain wings or certain floors or or, or a field building as opposed to a renovation. Well, what I'm really right. talking about, great question. What I'm really talking about is, of course, it's up to us. But if we did what you were talking about, based on my understanding, if I'm not mistaken, more if we went that route and we started that now, that's a 10 year process, I right. think. And it's because more expensive, of the shuffling isn't it? the kids it's around cost more. and it is going to cost more. So so really the people that are for those of us that listen, we all want that new high school. We want that for our kids. We wanted that 10 years ago. We wanted that 15 years ago. But it would have been financially irresponsible when 20 percent's taken away and we couldn't just turn around and say, that's OK, just pass that on cost on to the taxpayers. Well, and guess what, I guess what we need to know, though, but do you see that as being feasible in this next 10 year period, in this next five year period to however long it takes to build it? Absolutely. I see that feasible, feasible as far as can we do that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, the voters pass. I obviously can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. But as no, far, I'm, I'm sure. so as far as if we're talking about an operating levy we had in 2010, the next operating levy we had on the ballot in 2018, mm -hmm. then it, so we're talking about the next operating levy really not being on the ballot until uh, 2026. That that that's a, that's eight, eight years. That, well, that, that is, is a solid solid time. That's a solid time period. And then if. Obviously, we're, we've always been at Solon. We've always been open, very transparent. 
And so this wouldn't change. So it, our thought, I would imagine, that if we went for an operating levy, we would be able to talk to our taxpayers at that point in time, listen, this passes, perhaps we've already decided, this passes, next stop's gonna be a bond issue. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be for 10, 10 years? Or 20 oh, years or more than that. The bond issue would be 30 plus years. Yeah. It would it's be, gonna be, you're talking like it'd be 30 plus years. Dollars. It'd be 35 ish years, give or take a couple years. Now, again, obviously, as, um, as values increase, as values increase and rates decrease, uh, borrowing rates decrease, you know, that's one piece, but then you have your construction rates. If they increase, it's just, but to give you a ballpark idea, you know, we're talking, you know, we're talking seven ish. We're talking seven-ish mills. So, uh, Stephanie, to, to kind of put it into some really specifically so that hopefully we're getting your question answered, we're looking at a levy in 26, a bond issue in 28, and construction starting in 29 with completion in 31 or 32. And then you're going to do another offer. And then... Now again, the alternative. Let's talk about because this stuff has kept me up for night at, at night for 15 years, here, 16 years. The alternative is what we say we want it now. We need the new school now, so we put the bond issue on. We put the bond issue issue on, and we pass it, and we get moving. First of all, we have a problem because of the full property. So I'm not sure how we would work that out because that's a five-year. That's a five-year hold. So I don't even know if it's possible right now to do new, at least the way that the, the, the design is, to use that piece of property. But if that even was possible, and we pass the bond issue, it's considered a landslide in the state of Ohio if school operating levies pass 55% to 45%. It just is. They're usually 51% to 49% or tighter. So if we put that bond issue on first, the way that I view it is, is that we are putting, just my opinion, my question, my question, are we putting the immediate future, the, the immediate, uh, our kids' education for the immediate future at risk by that next operating levy, which will be needed, <laughs> which will be needed short term, I mean, inside of this five-year forecast, are we putting that at risk? And what happens if that operating levy fails? Well, yeah, because if you start failing levies, you... Mm. If you pass the bond issue, we have a new building there. Yeah, but you had a serious problem if you can't pass operating yeah. levies. And we know, we know, we know what we do as taxpayers. We know what we do as homeowners. We talk about what's so-and-so doing, building that nice big house or buying that nice car, and they can't even afford to do X, Y, and Z. These are the essentials. We don't... That's not how we operate. You know, we don't... We don't want... We want to make sure that the lifeblood, our education, that's what we've always done. We want to make sure that that is not at risk. And I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to, you know, uh, push here or be too strong. Uh, 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 but my opinion is is that uh, that we we don't risk um, risk that and put the bond issue first and just hope that the operating levy passes after that. So maybe just for completeness' sake answer why not do the operating levy 2.5 we could do so we could do the operating levy so no great question we could do the operating levy for 25 so if we did the operating levy for 25 hypothetically um, I could probably I, I could probably hurry up uh, I believe we might have time I'm not sure um, to contact the county have the first resolution on and put it on for the spring of 25 make it effective 1-1 one, one of 25, collected 1-1 one, one of 26. Uh, we, could, we could do that. What I don't like about that is, is that, listen, we have a cash balance. We have a cash balance by design that we've told our taxpayers that we have a cash balance. And the reason because of the TPP, and this year is the first year we told them after we're no longer relying or worried about the TPP dollars going away, we're going to spend that down on our building facility needs, and we're gonna make some big improvements that are needed here in Solon. So that's what we're doing now, holding true to what we've said for 12 years with that cash balance. 
That cash balance is going to go down. Yes, it's going to go down. But right now, it would at the time of the levy, it will not have gone down all the way. And I worry about next year people looking at our cash balance saying the one thing that we've always told them for years uh, that we always said is, listen, we're not going to ask for a levy. You keep the money in your pockets until we ask for it. And when we ask for it, we need it. And the taxpayers have always entrusted us with that, and we don't tax them too early. We try to hold on as long as we can. So I worry about um, I, back in that levy in, in 2010, we had a very thin cash balance. I mean, it was it was it was roughly 10 percent. It was headed towards 10 percent. It was very small, and I had a few individuals out there in 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 the public that were accountants, and they had a different opinion on what our cash balance should be, and it should even be lower. And that's that that's the concern that I have there. Obviously, I I'm not the individual. You know, controlling, hey, if you want to put a levy on um, in the spring or in 2025 and begin collecting on it in 1126, not a problem, but that's a primary concern that I have is, is that the higher cash balance we well, would have. Tim, from, a, from, from my perspective and, and also from your perspective, our current state legislature, their interpretation of the laws on how we communicate about levies and how we're allowed to advertise for them makes it very difficult for Tim and I to get out into the community to basically communicate to taxpayers and re-educate them about how we're doing those things. We need a longer runway to effectively communicate those things, especially given it's been so long since our last levy. We have to mobilize a lot of people to make sure that we have the necessary education. So putting a levy on, we really want to give ourselves a full year of ramp up to ramp up the committee to fundraise to help us to, to do all the necessary advertisement and, and educational events that we need to do to explain these things to people because it's they're complicated issues that we have to re-educate people every time we go for one. And, and I think we've been, I don't think, I know we've been very fortunate over the years because we have not had any structured, any, any group that was opposing. We've never had any real opposition to levies. Um, we weren't in the age of emails and constant communication. So that's going to be a difference in a levy for this time. We've never had a levy on the ballot where information was as easily transferred as it is now. Um, to Tim's point, I mean, at that last levy, I mean, there were literally um, accountants that were people that were going through neighborhoods, stuffing mailboxes to the effect that we did not need the money, you know, that it was not the right time. Um, we, we do have to keep in mind that our, our tax base is, is, a far, is far more knowledgeable, far more in tune, and is easier. You, know, it, you almost have to kind of think of you know, some opposition as it goes forward. And I know there was the last time, and it was a, a really a critical need at that time, and we still had some difficult moments. Well, and I, I, think that, I think the fund balance, regardless of how we've committed those dollars and what we're doing with those things, it's a harder sell for a levy with a balance than there with a larger balance than there is with a smaller balance yes and we've made commitments on how we're going to use those dollars but to explain that to the average homeowner it's it's a much it's a much bigger lift if you will to explain those things to a homeowner to go through it i think our levy record i think our levy record is as good as it is is because we're always very fiscally responsible in terms of when and how we put our issues on the ballot yeah, it, it's really, and uh, uh, Mrs. Obramowitz, it's very, you, you know, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a quick story of what we've always done here at Solon is, you know, so for our debt instruments, trying to refinance. We wanted to refinance, and the higher you are rated, the, the more likely you are to be able to receive more, uh, the better credit you have, mm -hmm. the better rate you can get, period. And what we always try to do is we maintain a credit rating, uh, rating with Fitch and with Moody's. And we were all always double, double A1. One above, it, one above it, one tier above it is the best. Perfect. Triple A. Triple A rated. And, and this is where a disconnect is. Um, and, and it's hard to understand between private and public uh, businesses and entities, and specifically in this case, school districts. Uh, we always said that, you know what? Keep your money in your pocket, taxpayer. We appreciate your trust in us. When we need it, we'll ask. And if you can afford it, please support our schools. 
We go to uh, Moody's. We try to get that triple A rating. We had a solid fund balance projected all the way out. Solid, I want to say it was like 20, 25% projections. It was roughly 25% projections, which is where we'll be come levy time in, in, in a year, two years. We're going to be around that percent, 20, 25% as far as the carryover cash balance. Moody's wouldn't give us a triple A bond rating unless the Board of Education passed a minimum fund balance resolution. Like 25 million? 20, it was 25%. 25 million, yeah. 25%. 25%, yeah, we so said that we can't it, do that. So that it would require boards of education to put automatically put a levy on as soon as you're nearing and going below that 25% cash reserve balance. Meanwhile, <coughs> the levy before that, I had a, a couple, they were a couple like me, CPAs. They were very sharp. They, they, and again, not trying to hide it, but their opinion was you need to be around that 7% cash balance you you shouldn't be at the 12 percent we were at that point in time to put a levy uh, levy on and when you're talking about obviously you know five thousand kids and you're talking about when you by the time you put a levy on because you gotta put a levy on for a year two years you're making money you have a little bit of a net profit but then most of the time you're living in the red because of it, uh, inflationary expenses and flat revenues so most of the time, your deficit spending, the key is, is to deficit spend to where your cash balance gets to a, an acceptable point, acceptable for us, acceptable for our taxpayers, and to be able to pass a levy at the right time so that the first year of your levy, you're not adam, automatically deficit spending again. And, and, it, and, and, and it's, then that's something that, that's a little tough to do for schools, and that's what we try to do here. Any, any, uh, any other questions? I know it's tough, but I, I, and this is obviously this is a big issue because the big issue is building a new facility. The second big issue is obviously funding said yeah, building that we it. want to build. There's a lot that goes around around this, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're doing these finance facts are so that we can continually explain these things to people. I want to be sensitive to our time, and I know I know Tammy has a huge thing, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the alternative funding viabilities thing. Because we, we've done less work on this one than the other one. Uh, this past summer, uh, you all passed a new policy, which you can see in your book under facilities, the last blue tab. That's the advertising and commercial activities policy. This is a policy that our district historically has avoided applying to our district. We did not want to have advertising in our district. It's something that we've done very limited over the years to go through it, and we never had a policy. It was just forbidden. We felt the need through strategic planning to expand our opportunities to garner external revenue, uh, doing things like advertising, corporate sponsorships, and things of that nature. Um, we, step one was passing this policy that allows us to start doing those things. Step two, which is the step that we are actively doing now, is reaching out to our um, booster organizations to talk about opportunities for ways to generate revenue that are outside of those things. I can tell you that um, from the perspective of what we've seen in other districts, the amount of money we can collect isn't going to get us to $135 million. It's not going to get us close to that. But it can get us to um, maybe some of the way through big corporate sponsors or things like that, or some of the way for part of an athletics complex or, or one of those extra things that we would need to go through that. But we have a lot of work that needs to be done in this space before we can do those things. I know in our conversation with our boosters, we're going to be reaching out to other districts and looking at the way that they're doing things. Um, but we also want to do it our way. We don't want to turn, um, uh, what's the name of the baseball field again? I'm really sorry to show my utter ignorance about baseball Infield? once again. Caesar, no, Caesar. not Caesar. Oh, the, the one, one downtown? The one downtown. Oh, Formerly known as the Jacobs Field? Used to be called the Jacobs. Progressive. Jake. Yeah, it's progressive. progressive Field now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're not trying to turn our stadium into Progressive Field where there's a piece of advertising on every square inch and on the kids' uniforms and things like that. But we're looking to look at ways to expand our advertising profile so that we can 
have access to those dollars that we wouldn't have normally so that we can use those things for our kids or for other activities. Uh, reaching out to, you've, you've seen in the news how they have done a, a naming rights activity. They've worked with a consultant about naming rights to see how much money the city can generate from naming some of their events from that. And the results of that are still to be determined. But to see how school districts would have access to doing those types of things. And do we reach out to places like Nestle and Swage Lock and the other large, uh, the large uh, industry that we have in the area to see how they can do those things. But those are long tail things. Do we things. know how much you know, places like Strongsville got from Joe? And that's the thing that we're, that's where we're actively doing. Because there's now. a number of districts that have already done this. And yes, there are. And that's part of, part of what we're doing is reaching out to those districts to see how much money are you guys making from these things? Mm -hmm. How much money did you get to, to create Pakatan Stadium right. and to, to create uh, the one in uh, the Bob Serpentini Stadium, Serpentini yeah. Stadium? Yeah. Like how much those things were. We, of course, can't rename Stewart Field but we can have the, the stadium at Stewart Field or things like that. They do, I, I know my alma mater has a, the stadium's called one thing and the field's called another. So they, they give n naming and things like that. But how much money is a reasonable ask for something like that is something that more research has to be done on. So we're actively working on that now. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is um, five minutes. And then we are going to transition to communications.